Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Are you having a good time at LibertyCon Europe so far? <laughs> Fantastic. Love to hear it. Thank you so much for being here. I'm joined today by Patrick Schumacher, as you all know. We have a very limited amount of time this evening for this interview, so we're going to get started right away. So as you know, Patrick Schumacher is an extraordinary architect who's done amazing work with Zaha Adid Architect. And I just really want to get started. Um, I know you actually have a doctorate in philosophy, as some people may actually not know. Are there any philosophers that have shaped your beliefs so far? Any notable philosophers that you look to or admire? Um, for sure. One of them I think was very seminal for me was uh, late Ludwig Wittgenstein, who uh, was incredibly influential in the 20th century, uh, basically grounding philosophy in the philosophy of language and understanding language to be practically and pragmatically grounded. So intellectual life is ultimately grounded in practical life. So it was the first uh, uh, thing which is very important to reflect upon when we think that what we talk about needs to kind of cash out in real life consequences. Knowing what we're talking about is knowing that what we would do uh, in accordance with what we're talking about. And that cuts out a lot of talk, by the way, as kind of um, fanciful, meaningless metaphysics. Second one I want to mention is very important and it's maybe a bit controversial here is Karl Marx. And he also, by the way, was, his intellectual life was very kind of grounded in practical pursuits and he was the one who first said, he's a very young man, very ambitious man, uh, that the philosophers have so far only interpreted the world and the point is to change it. And when I stepped in earlier, there was change the world kind of slogan, that's what we all share and we, and we should open up and learn from Marx. And what I learned of Marx is not the, the, the actual predictions and policies and, and, and uh, recipes for, for human progress, but that he took upon his shoulder to think through and take responsibility to think through the conditions and possibilities and options for humanity as a project to flourish. And that he understood that there's a deep kind of understanding of how humanity evolves, emerged, continues to prosper potentially. He has an economics-based uh, uh, um, condition of, 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 of um, human uh, politics, but also uh, deep sociologically and conceptually grounded economics. So historical materialism is his, uh, let's say, very influential and may maybe nearly universally now accepted approach of understanding history and development as tied in with the material freedom and progress uh, and basically an economic space understanding of the world and its future. So here we go. All right, Karl Marx, what do we <laughs> think? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Well, actually leads me to my next question. How does architecture and urban planning fit into libertarianism? It's very critical and very important because uh, the real estate market, in particular the segment, the housing provision, is one of the most um, distorted and interventiously kind of hampered markets in all of the uh, economy. And uh, we see massive distortions and problems. And it's also incredibly important, you think about it, our sense of well-being and progress is also registering how we live, where we live, and how we uh, uh, create ourselves a kind of hospitable home on this hostile planet or universe, potentially hostile universe. And we have an enormous interference, enormous kind of hampering of an historically important process we're seeing right now, which is a new urban convergence and urban renaissance, we, where the 20th century was kind of spreading out uh, into the suburbs with greenfield factories and the so-called forest paradigm of medical mass reproduction. Um, and now we have to come together into these kind of R&D and knowledge economy hubs, and we want to uh, concentrate in urban centers with new lifestyle and politics has frozen up this process and makes it nearly impossible to make that happen. And it's not only, it's planning restrictions, it's uh, the nimbyism which preventing and, and j j jacking up prices, it's imposition of standards, there's so much interference and also it's a big ideological challenge because a lot of people feel that this isn't working and they attribute this to the market because we obviously have a mixed economy where there is the element of market and entrepreneurship and, and market process and the element of politics and the negatives are often attributed to the wrong side. So it's an enormous important, important field for libertarians 
to crack on and understand this because we have that affordability and housing crisis which is on everybody's mind and we know where, how to attribute problems and where the solution lies on the side of liberty. So it's really interesting because you know, when I envision the future, we see, like you said, you know, growing land prices, we see um, you know, rising in population density, and honestly, I kind of envision flying cars in the future potentially. So I'm thinking of a world where we're growing vertically and not horizontally, but what's your take on that? Yeah, absolutely. I believe in urban concentration, and that means building vertically, connecting vertically, and we need to get freedom. We need to have entrepreneurs and urban entrepreneurs to come in and imagine that future and finding those co-location synergies which make a city thrive and not be hampered by arbitrary height limits, by arbitrary setback lines, by standards, by bureaucrats, let's say, prescribing where is retail, where is offices, how much of everything, where is residential, the unit mix. I mean, it's crazy. Everything is frozen up for decades on old plans, and it's a total deadlock. But we need to have this intensity. I believe in super high density in in walkable cities, pedestrian cities, and um, all these kind of new potential forms of mo mobility need to be unleashed, and we need to get bureaucrats out of the way. So I think I see a very, very high density urbanism, and I think that's also the best way to be resilient when it comes to climate change and these kind of issues, that we are kind of concentrated in, in, in these big hub cities. It's good for inter-awareness, interactivity, inter action and research development, marketing, finance, where we're thriving on. But also, I think it's, it's a much more resilient form of, of taking up that challenge of climate change. Well, I'd really love for you to come to DC and tell our, our people in DC that we need to get rid of these ordinances so we can start growing up, because as we see all, a lot around the world. I mean, the costs are ginormous, the economic yeah. costs. Um, and what I see also, for instance, in my firm, of over 400 people, and the urgency and need to be centrally located People are willing to spend 80% of the salary or more to be part of that urban hub, but the product isn't coming through. Prices are very artificially high, and it is a constraint on, on all of our prosperity. It's a huge burden, and needs to be, we need to absolutely burn that house down and make, 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 let freedom kind of and, and entrepreneurship flourish in that domain. We heard the man. <laughs> okay, so you brought up climate change, which is actually really fascinating, yeah. um, especially now in this age. It's been such a big part of the conversation internationally really with Greta and so many others you know talking about it also with how technology has advanced with eco-friendly materials and whatnot how has that affected your work and do you think architects have a responsibility to take this into consideration for future generations to come absolutely I mean in in my field it's been on the radar for maybe 20 30 years we have been looking at sustainability we have been doing these certification systems etc but the last year or so, a bit more, there's been this tsunami of awareness, a total sea change of intensification. It's actually the Greta Thunberg plus kind of phenomenon, and we gotta take that on. I mean, and we can, uh, and we have to find solutions. And we have built a task force inside the firm. We have had be part of proclamations of making this happen. But it's also, of course, a huge danger as well for the, these kind of new green deals coming forward and there's a kind of potential of ramping up statism to a new level and people are calling for it and find it natural and necessary. And that's why we have to set other free market solution against that. And that's something we have to do very quickly. And we can't, I believe, take the route of, which I often see too much of in the libertarian movement of being kind of denying the science, being climate deniers, minimizing the issue. Uh, and tr that's not going to be convincing. And I do somehow believe that we, we, we're facing a challenge here because we also have to, we're facing a new generation. They're living another 60, 70 years. And there are serious questions. But I don't believe it's, of course, it's not uh, through government, it's not through imposition, it's through voluntary, through discourse and voluntary imposition. And I've, there's evidence of this in my field. Most of the buildings we're now kind of constructing, they're far beyond what was required in terms of uh, lowering the, the, the carbon footprint, we're talking zebon carbon, voluntarily by clients demanding it, developers delivering this, lead gold, platinum, and better. So we can rely on this. We don't need government to come in. Actually, the, the private sector is willing to do more, and what we need is discourse. And I mean, the title of this talk is Markets and Discourses. And I, a new politics is the politics of discourses. And, you know, 
a self-respecting person wouldn't wear um, um, a fur now in, 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 in social situations or smoke like crazy in front of everybody. So we are susceptible to um, uh, social currents when, when issues and modes of behavior become viral and, and you, you do get standards imposed socially, voluntarily, and we don't need governments to come in. That's what I believe. But we need to offer these kind of solutions. And with, with respect to free market environmentalism, Terry Anderson, and these kind of discourses, they're also very important. So, so privatization and property can go a long way. I don't think that it can go all the way to solving climate change. But the issue is a tsunami of pressure, and only those political leaders uh, will, will succeed who can credibly tackle that. So one thing that you discussed is, you know, the title of this talk, and one thing that we wanted to really talk about is political life after the Absolutely. Libertarian Revolution. And so I'm really interested from your perspective, what does the Libertarian Revolution encompass, and what is it going to look like afterwards? What's life in the world going to entail after that fact? Well, my perspective is actually, I'm sharing with David Friedman, for instance, I'm quite radical. In the end, I think we can have a totally um, anarcho-capitalist um, a situation where there's no coercive central government we're kind of locked into and we would have, we would have free contracting. Of course, there's governance. And recently, I mean, there's a very fascinating book by, by Stringham about private governance, showing how many of the issues we look for government, government was actually a way of hampering and not allowing these processes. For instance, if it's uh, the whole thing of, of, of stock markets, of, of things like electronic payment systems more recently. There are private solutions, I believe, in multiple interpenetrating uh, private judici uh, judicial systems, private courts, private security systems, etc. Everything could be, could be private and, and in terms of, it could also be a, another part of the story would be secessionism of small uh, communities trying different things. There needs to be a thousand flowers blooming. That's kind of hippie slogan, which I often refer to. So, so that would be a picture. And how would we get there? Um, I think that all it requires, in a way, it's something like a radicalized version of the Thatcher Reagan revolution, uh, which then became kind of denigrated as a neoliberal um, uh, era. That was very progressive in many ways. It, didn't get, it solved some of the major crises of the 70s and then got stuck and kind of socialism and statism and these tendencies kind of get back into game and we have a kind of war of attrition where this kind of radical movement got, got kind of flattened out and I believe uh, and what it originated in a deep crisis of the social democratic uh, welfareist, statist model in the 70s where they also killed the currencies and, every, and many other things went wrong. Uh, and you had uh, Britain really with three days of, of electricity strikes everywhere, a nation which was proudly famous for uh, its kind of decency and, 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 and reliable and trustworthiness was turned into, into a nation of, uh, let's say, uh, tax evaders and benefit cheaters. So, so it was so bad that there was somebody with credible policies, an alternative from the side and could break through. And that's what I think we can find once more. And we're facing another crisis. I don't think it will happen without a crisis. It all, and that was basically Marx also understood. Crisis is a big kind of galvanizer, politicizing. I was politicized into libertarianism in 2008. And that, I think, gave this movement a kind of boost on many levels. And it also gave the kind of left a boost, too, of course, with the Occupy movement. So that's what I envision. I envision, for instance, simply a crisis coming down um, uh, over Europe, uh, Scotland becoming independent, potentially. They have the kind of dream, the socialist dream, for a few months and totally go, go down and crash. And then somebody is there, and we need to prepare. We need to build the political program. We need to make the predictions. We need to point to what we've been saying and offer solutions, credible solutions. And then I think somebody could take over and you know, connect back to Adam Smith and Scott, and that's one of the scenarios I see. And all it requires, I think, is one such country in the advanced world, of course, who would, who would, who would show within a few years that you could be surging ahead where everybody else is still in kind of crisis mode and stagnation, and we're in stagnation for over 10 years in Europe with no productivity gains, with the kind of AI revolution on the horizon which isn't simply happening. So that's what, where I'm coming in, the urgency. So I believe there is there is 
hope, but we need to prepare, we need to be ready, and that's why I like, for instance, the neoliberalist manifesto, which was presented earlier today, uh, which, which has a full kind of program, could be like a party program, that's what we need to do, and this is the place to, 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 to think about it. And by the way, I had a great day already today with some, some really cool sessions. Fantastic. Well, we hope you're sticking around for more. <laughs> So it sounds like the, what you would, in, would call the catalyst for this libertarian yeah. revolution would be an advanced country, you know, kind of changing the way they do things yeah. and showing everyone else. Any ideas or intuitions on which country will be the well, first said, to start be, the libertarian revolution? I'm, I don't know. I feel it's going to be Scotland, an independent Scotland, but only after being really going down the gutter <laughs> with that kind of socialist pipe dreams being busted up. Okay, cool. Um, but it could also, I mean, I love, you know, I, I think Europe should be broken up. I love Brexit in this sense that this kind of behemoth Europe, which is forcing everybody into stagnation. I mean, the whole kind of IT uh, startup culture is kind of hampered by yeah. Europe here. Uh, gene technology is hampered. This has to be broken up, but also countries like Spain should be broken up into, you know, why aren't the Basque and the, and the Catalans and the, and the various places? Germany should be broken up. Italy, why isn't they kind of dragging on South Italy for, 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 for decades? There's no, no, no good reason why kind of in the central, in the middle of Europe, you have kind of South Italy in kind of eternal stagnation and backwardness. I think this will all change if these things are uh, broken up into and become self-responsible, agile, competing entities with competing jurisdictions and policy ideas, and I would believe that this competition drives, this competition will drive into the freedom policies, because so they're the succeeding policies. But if everybody is monopolized under a big European umbrella, that can happen. That it's a kind of cartel of not experimenting with policies. So when is this revolution going to take place? When can we get everyone rallied, ready to go and... Well, we need to first prepare, because otherwise we're going to have a crisis and we're descending into right-wing, uh, let's say, national socialism. Mm. And then, we re then the risk is, of course, that we're going so far backward that, that we can't just turn the corner quickly. What I'm talking about is a short crisis with a prepared um, organization, you know, very clued, clued in, and there needs to be some kind of form of organization. Maybe that's also different from the libertarian movement. It's not only the free flow of, 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 of um, discourses. That's very important. It's deeply important also the research, the philosophical grounding, the discourse and debate, but there also needs to be party building. And that's what we need to learn. We can actually learn from Lenin. And if I went to, and Rothbard was a kind of uh, undercover Leninist. He was reading the works of Lenin and was trying to do something, learning the lessons from that. And I think we need to be prepared. Life is too short. I don't want this to happen in my lifetime. Okay. Well, <laughs> what do you think the biggest threat is for the libertarian revolution to not take place? What well, the we threat is this for? kind of lethargy if the movement is happy to do think tanks and educationals and, edu and, and not move in, become more serious, action-oriented. So what we're lacking is the Rothbard, what we're lacking is maybe Ron Paul, where's the next figure of that kind, the charismatic leader who can, who can uh, push through with this message, and, but also build the, build the cadres, build the group, build the support networks. Uh, that's the lethargy problem, and of course the other big risk is that this kind of socialist tendency keeps going and the Green New Deal is actually hitting us. That's why I think this, this issue over there in the, in the discussion about neoliberalism was also, we can't only talk generalities, we have to take on issue by issue. So it needs to be the kind of climate change and environmentalism issue. It needs to be the housing and urban development issue. It needs to be health. Health becomes a huge kind of explosion of costs in America, there's all the wrong recipes and there's a kind of health economics, libertarian health policies we need to build on. So all these issues have to be tackled and then they also have to be integrated. That's why it requires a kind of an organizational matrix. There could be several organizations which come forward and step up and do this. But I, what I love there, the ambition to have a comprehensive policy set. And these guys are kind of young, uh, eager, and ambitious characters, and congratulations, guys. More of that. But do the next step. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the title of this talk, you know, is talking about political life after this libertarian revolution, which I know we're all going to play our part in, right? Awesome. 
So I myself subscribe as an anarchist. I don't know if I have any other anarchists in the room with me. OK, thank you. I'm not alone. So when I heard the title of this talk, I was a bit skeptical. I know you're a very like, intelligent, brilliant man, but I was skeptical. So how do you envision politics will play a role? Very good question. That's very important. And that's why, um, of course, politics will be different. You know, where, how this occurred to me to tackle, I mean, if you imagine a full-blooded politician, somebody who cares about the pr human project going forward, like a Murray Rothbard, a Ron Paul, uh, and imagine that the libertarian revolution would, would envisage a society which is a society where it's only market exchanges of private individuals and, 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 and nothing public and not, no public uh, arena and, and all, uh, conditions, and you then kind of go back to attend your backyard or garden instead of attending to the human project. That's for me not credible. So I believe in a politics which is actually going to intensify, um, but it's not leading into all the debate discussions programs are funneled into this moment of the big election, the decision of a group of people, uh, and then the kind of one-fit-all majoritarian dictate of these decisions. I believe in a world which is dispersed, many trajectories and tendencies, but all of them relevant, globally uh, um, um, interesting, globally competing, and they need to be debated. They need to be debated. These are going to be political debates about the tendencies, effects of certain different systems of law, different systems of setting up courts, and there will be parallel systems, different ways of investing, different forms of money. They will not only exist and compete in the market because it's too complex, you cannot make choices. They will be intensely debated. And who, these will be people, the debaters will not only be motivated to, pro, to peddle a product, they this is all be proselytizing for solutions. I mean, we have so much energy and time left now with this level of prosperity we achieved that we are engaged and passionately pursuing the, you know, the common wheel, the, the, the prosperity potentials of mankind, including everybody. And that's why we're sitting here. It's not because we have a, there's a market exchange here where we're looking after our private interests. That's not what brings us here. And there's a fallacy that nearly sometimes I feel, although it's fairly explicit, that there is this idea of a society of anarchist, uh, individualist society. We're all individualists. But hey, we love the feeling of coming together. Mm -hmm. We love to, the power of transforming the world collectively, but not with a, with a vote and then a dictate by bureaucrats, but as an ongoing discourse. So we need to have a theory of markets plus discourses. I think that's pretty but good. these are the, they're just not vain talk, they are practically oriented and then projects flow out of these discourses. Like we have this discourse on free private city and we have, we have entrepreneurs trailing ahead and then you observe what they're happening and then you criticize them. You criticize this model but also you need to, you need to soft, so these are sometimes also expert communications and scientific debates uh, which tie in but this is all for me public political debate in a sense. Everything could become a polit political issue and that's my version of a political life, a much more intense, a much more exhilarating political life because there are so many things to debate. Now it's only kind of one budget every year and one kind of party manifesto for four years. There will be so much more to debate and engage with and make happen. And I call this political life after the libertarian revolution. So we could all not go back to our backyards, but we could all on the frontier of changing the world. Awesome. We only have time for, please clap, yeah, awesome. So I'm sad because we're running out of time. I told you this would be a very short interview and I mean, we could talk all day, I feel, but imagining, you know, five to 10 years from now, what societal advances are you most looking forward to? Well, without the return revolution, it will be kind of more of the same. But I, I live, I'm working on AI and um, an AI infested and transformed city life and buildings which are full of robots and architectural agents, furniture which understands what we want to do next, partitions, opening doors, lighting systems, urban systems. And there would be autonomous creatures which help us 
to live with each other and we would live with them, I think there's a lot of potential. There are interactive installations on the art world. We have autonomous vehicles. But this is much more broad, much more wide, that we will have a, 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 a new kind of symbiosis, man-machine symbiosis. But the machines are not our slaves where we, we remote controlling because we don't know what we should instruct them to do. They need to become co creative, spontaneous, intelligent participants in an overall uh, new metabolism and life process, and I think we can achieve that, but not if we have the politicians blocking everything, not if it's a kind of precautionary principle overriding everything else, not if there's somebody's against it and we all have to hold hand to make the first move. We have to allow pioneers to make the moves now and then learn from each other. We need to be risk takers, and I'm willing to take these risks. My God, I mean, I don't want to be hanging around another 35 years and nothing of this has happened. Mm -hmm. I want to be in, live that dream with all of you, of course. But we need to, so it's a political barrier. It's really what Marx has been saying. That, you know, the revolution comes when the, the political system and the relations of production and the social relations become a barrier on the development of the forces of production. And that's what we've reached big time. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Patrick. I really appreciate you being here with us. Are we done? We are done. That okay. was it. We can clap some more again. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And stay tuned thank for the you. next keynote. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Appreciate thank you. it.